Click, yay! Okay, so Angular 1 started because we wanted to help developers write great web applications with a JavaScript framework that could take some of the harder parts of developing for the web and make them easier, things like two-way data binding and dependency injection. When we began working on Angular 2, we wanted to take all of that experience we had building and supporting Angular 1 and build a core foundation that could support a thriving ecosystem. If you've been following along with our progress, you might have noticed that we had a pretty big event a couple of weeks ago. It was my birthday. <laughs> and we announced the final release of Angular 2. So if you didn't get to join us live or watch the live stream, what this means to you is that Angular 2 is now ready for you to build production apps that are fast and small. We consider this the first milestone in our endeavor to making you guys be able to build great apps for any platform easy. And we didn't do it alone. GitHub recently uh, released the State of the Octoverse, which is basically a report that shows contributions to large open source frameworks. Thank you and our gratitude to the over 12,000 people who contributed to Angular, giving us your insights and your feedback and making Angular one of the largest open source frameworks in the world. We traditionally use the number of 30-day active visitors to our doc site to get an idea of how many developers are using Angular. Last year at Angular Connect, we announced that 1.1 million developers were on Angular 1. We've seen a little bit of growth with another 100,000 developers joining them. <clears throat> and we've been pleasantly surprised that while in beta and up till now, over 600,000 developers are learning and adopting Angular 2. We will continue to support Angular 1 until this chart flip-flops and the majority of developers are using Angular 2. For Angular 1 developers, we're focused on bringing Angular 2 concepts to Angular 1 where possible. Uh, the component architecture that was landed in Angular 1.5 has proven pretty popular, and so the team is focused on improving that, as well as aligning to jQuery 3, uh, improving performance and reducing code size. But we heard loud and clear during our beta process that what you really need is stability. And so the first step to stability is our move to semantic versioning with Angular 2.0. So what you can expect with Sember is that we'll put bug fixes and patch releases, backwards compatible feature additions in minor releases, and any incompatible API changes we may need to make will land in major versions only. This is great, knowing what to expect, but we want to be better than great. We want you to be able to anticipate when a release might come as well. So in addition to Sember, we're working on a release cadence. Our goal is to get to about a six month, a steady rhythm of six months between each major release. In addition, we're committed to evolving Angular so that it always meets the needs for the apps you need to build. There are two steps to our strategy here. The first is that stable APIs remain stable but not stagnant. So today we're also announcing a deprecation policy. What you can expect from this is that we will announce the deprecation alongside an idea of what we think will happen post-deprecation, and then we commit to removing that API two major versions later. The second step is that the API docs at Angular.io will always tell you if an API is stable or experimental. Experimental APIs are those we're still working on, and so the deprecation policy doesn't exist for them, but we will still follow Sember rules. So let's talk a little bit about what Angular is. At the heart of Angular 2 is a core foundation with all the common APIs you need to build apps, with things like declarative templating that allow you to use standard HTML and Angular markup to create powerful UIs. Automatic change detection, making one of the hardest parts of developing an app easy. Angular 1 pioneered dependency injection for the front-end development world. Angular 2 builds on this, giving you the most powerful DI of any framework out there. Our component model allows you to structure your apps with a natural separation of concerns and a reusable architecture. Our compiler is capable of static analysis, giving you not only small and fast apps, but also improved error messaging and automatic refactoring. And probably my favorite feature is the ability to swap renderers so that you get true DOM independence and can target platforms where no DOM exists. Obviously, this is not even close to all the features and functionality that exists in Angular's core. Um, so please make sure you join us for the keynote tomorrow, where Igor and Rob will go into a deeper dive on how Angular 2 works. <clears throat> um, as I said earlier, we wanted to develop this core framework so that you could build really cool things on top of it. And we built a few things ourselves like Angular Material, which gives you a component toolbox so you can go from no app to beautiful app really fast. I18N for all of your internationalization needs. 
a powerful router so you can get your users around your app where they need to go. Forms for structured user input. Animations, so your apps respond with style. An ng upgrade, which allows you to mix and match Angular 1 and Angular 2 in the same application, so you can migrate at your own pace and not face a full rewrite. Obviously, not every app needs all of these things. So one of the great things about Angular is it leaves you in control. Don't need it? Leave it out. Don't want to use our implementation? Want to build your own? Go for it. Or use one of the many op options that are, exist in our ecosystem with more to come. Another core value of Angular 1 was we wanted to make it more joyful and easy to be a developer. Angular 2 embraces this and improves on it, giving you the Angular command line interface, which has everything you need to get started quickly. Just type ng new. But also has all the commands you need to add components and services as your app grows. Protractor gives you end-to-end -end testing made for Angular. And the folks at Wrangle.io have been keeping up with our development and released Augury, which gives you real-time insights into your application structure and performance characteristics. And finally, we've been working on a set of language services so your favorite IDE understands Angular syntax and gives you good error messaging and refactoring tips <clears throat> so you can write not just good code but great code. And there's one last thing that often goes overlooked when we talk about Angular as a platform, and that is the docs at our website on angular.io. We released new docs for every release we made. We will continue to update those docs and add new subjects. So if you were looking for a way to get started, this is it. And now I'd like to bring the father of Angular and truly the bee's knees on stage to talk a little bit about performance, Mishko. Good morning and thank you, Jules. So I want to talk about performance. And performance is hard. I'm sure you guys tried it. And the reason for it is people really would like to say that A is better than B. But really, there isn't a single number that you can measure. Rather, it's a collection of numbers that you need to focus on to make sure that you get all of these numbers down consistently. And the other thing that's hard is that it's really easy to write a benchmark that actually measures the wrong thing. And so I would like to talk to you today for a little bit about all the things we're doing to make sure that Angular 2 is performant. Now, performance really comes into two categories. One is you want to focus on making sure that the bytes you ship to the, uh, the client is as small as possible. And there's two strategies we have about making it smaller and uh, making it lazy loadable. And the second thing you can focus on is speed, which is how do you make it go faster? And this is a combination of just having better algorithms, figuring out how not to do stuff that you don't have to do right now, and taking advantage of things like multi-threading and making sure that you don't create a lot of garbage so that the uh, garbage collector doesn't have to do a lot of work. So this is what most uh, frameworks, this is kind of a generic slide what most frameworks will have to do, which is they'll have to somehow take the HTML, CSS, and annotations and run it through some sort of a compiler and then interpret you, the code, the, the templates in the face of your application. And this is what Angular 1 has done and this is what Angular 2, what the JIT is doing today in the browser. And so the way to make this thing smaller is to push as many of these things into the build step as possible. And so what are the things that we focus really hard with is to be able to pre-generate a lot of code in the build step. And this is what is called as the ahead of time compilation. And the thing that's to notice here is that when you move things into the build step, a couple of things fall out. Like for example, the DI runtime, the change detection and view runtime. Uh, and over time, we're gonna work on actually making more of these things to fall out as well. So for example, uh, we, would be, we would like to be able to make renderer. If we know that you're targeting a browser, then we would like to get rid of the renderer and just directly write to the DOM as well. And so these are the kind of ideas we're thinking about in order to decrease the size. Now, the, th the first thing you do with the offline compilation is uh, you, you offline compile and you generate the template. In other words, you take the HTML and CSS and you turn it into a TypeScript code. The, the thing to do after that is you can essentially concatenate all the files together. Now, ES6 has module systems, and the mod ES6 module systems are super useful in a lot of things, but they do provide a little bit of an overhead. So a concatenation is a good trick to get rid of the overhead. The next thing to do is to do tree shaking. And that's just a, what it just means is that you want to take your, uh, your code and statically analyze it and to see if there are classes that nobody uses. Now, why would you have classes that nobody uses? Well, for example, let's say you import material design and out of the material design, you only choose to use the material button. Well, in that case, uh, you don't want to pay for perhaps the material dialog box and material uh, date picker. And so what TreeShaker allows you to do is, is just ship the code that actually is needed. 
Uh, and so provided that the library like material design is written in a, in a tree shake friendly way, um, we can make sure that as little of the code gets shipped to the client as possible. And the final step is minification. Now you might notice as Aglify.js or a closure compiler, and there's a lot of different things you could do. You can, at the simplest thing, you could just remove the white space. Uh, a more advanced optimization is, for example, to rename the local variable names, which is always safe. Uh, the next optimization you could do is you can rename function uh, variable names. And that is not necessarily always safe. For example, as we know in Angular 1, because of the dependency injection actually uses the names inside of the functions, uh, you have to put it in a special bracket notation in order to uh, survive minification. And the next thing you could do is you can actually rename property names. And that's even trickier. And the reason why renaming property names is tricky is because if you look at this template over here, which says, you know, hello world, and has a greeting, uh, we extract the name out of the template. And then on the right-hand side, it's kind of a pseudocode of what the change detection looks like. And somewhere in the pseudocode, using the bracket notation, we have to read the name from the object. Then the problem it comes is that if the minifier goes and renames your property called name inside of the greeter to something like an A, which is shorter than a name, and saves you bytes down the wire, it doesn't know to also rename name into a, a, a single word A inside of the template because, well, minifiers don't understand templates. Now, we could theoretically teach the minifier to understand templates, but like such a minifier hasn't been written yet. And so most frameworks actually don't allow you to uh, rename property names, specifically because it would break across the templates. But when you do code generation, you can actually take advantage of that. Uh, you can actually take advantage of it and rename it as well. So Angular 2 does support this particular feature. Now, the next thing to, to look at is that we have uh, app modules, and app modules allow you to lazy load the code. In other words, an app module is kind of like a mini application within Angular. It tells the compiler uh, everything that's available, how to, what the context is, so which components and pipes are available inside of your template. It creates um, kind of a reusable component that is, can be lazy loaded through the, the dependency injection system. And so one of the cool things we can do is that you can get your application going with your, uh, with your injectors. As you can see, we have injectors for platform, for module, components, and elements. And then the router also has its own injector, and the router is capable then into itself loading additional modules. So first we kind of talked about how to make the code small, and now we said this is what you can do to uh, make the code, uh, to only use the code on as-needed basis. So now let's look at how we can make the speed go faster. So first is, can we make the algorithms go faster? So let's go back to our hello world greeter example. And let's imagine again that we have a name property that we would like to uh, change the on. This is what a normal change detection looks like before we do code generation. And there's two areas I'd like you to focus on, which is the red boxes over here. What well, turns out that VMs are really good at what's known as inline caching of property names. So this thing R, which is a short for a record, represents all of the things we have to dirty check when we go through the uh, digest cycle. And it turns out that R has a particular shape, which is a fancy word of saying what properties are on this particular object. And it turns out that because the way the code is written, the shape of R is always the same, and VMs love that. They realize, oh, it's always the same R that comes along here, and so R.object, I don't have to go to the hash map and look up the the property object where it is, instead I can just memorize. The last time I was here, I saw that r.object was on a location one, and so I know that I can just dereference one. I see that r.last was on location two, I can just memorize that. r.node was three, r.last was four, and so on and so forth. And so it can run through this in a very, very fast way. This is called monomorphic code and inline caching. Now the thing is with the red box is that the, every time it comes here, the shape of the r.object is always different, right? Because it depends on which uh, component you currently are looking at. The second thing that's problematic is that the r.property is always a different property every time the, the code gets here. And so the VM tries to cache this, but eventually it essentially busts the VM's cache because it only has four uh, inline caches. And so VM essentially gives up and says, you know what, I tried to make this fast, I don't know how, and it reverts to just a regular hash map lookup. And so what happens is, if you look at the code, the, the red two boxes account for over 90% of execution time of this loop. The solution to that is to actually generate the code on the right. 
Now, the, the code on the left could be written at the t uh, by the framework's author ahead of uh, the developer actually writing the code, right? So this is a generic code that can be run everywhere, and what we're taking advantage of that is reflection capabilities of the browser, of the, uh, the VM. On the other hand, on the right-hand side is code that's specific to the application code that you have written. So this code cannot be generated until we actually can look at the code you have written. Uh, and the key over there is the blue box over there where we say context.name. Notice in this case, because the code is generated, the context always refers to the instance of the component, and context.name is always the same property, and as a result, this becomes monomorphic. The result is that the code on the right runs about 10 times faster than the code on the left, which is a pretty significant boost in performance. In other words, your change detection in Angular 2 out of the box should be about 10 times faster than it was in Angular 1. Now, there's secondary benefits to this, because when we generate the code, we can actually go and put proper type information all throughout your, the generated code base. And that means that when the TypeScript compiler runs it, it can verify it. And the key over there is that we can flow the type information from the component into the template and from the template to the child components. And the, and the TypeScript compiler can verify that all throughout these steps, the uh, type information is correct, and if it's not, it can eagerly give you a feedback that you have probably made an error somewhere and you should have a look. And this is much nicer than, I'm sure all of you guys have written applications that didn't work and it was hard to figure out why, because you didn't have a type safety to, to tell you statically at the time of compilation that things are not really matching, that a particular component doesn't have a property that you think it does. Another benefit is that the exceptions you get at runtime are actually much nicer. Uh, in the past, if you got an exception inside of reading of your change detection, there was many stack frames that only made sense to the initiated of those who really understood the internal bowels of how Angular actually did its work. With code generation, the exception you get points to a generated code where if you open the line number, you will immediately recognize it's the expression that you have written. And because it's the expression you have written inside of a template, you're very familiar about how it works. And so any error messages that you get out of there are much easier to understand. So in this particular case, you can see that the error was that we were trying to dereference a name property, and the name property chose to throw an error. Now, the next thing is what we do is that uh, browser uh, HTML parsers are notorious at the fact that they try to parse the HTML even if it's not well-formed. And they essentially never give you an error. And this is a problem because you can throw malformed XML at a browser and at no point will it give you error. It will just do something it, it thinks is, is useful. And so we actually decided to write our own parser and there's several benefits for that. First of all, we have a schema and we know that a div, for example, doesn't have a tab index property. We know it's a tab dash index. And so we can eagerly say, like, I don't think this is what you meant to do and we can give you an error about that. We also know that there is no label property on a div, and so we can give you an error about that as well. And in the future, hopefully, we'll also be able to tell you that div doesn't have an event called slide, an error on that. And finally, we can uh, give you a, we can let you know that you improperly closed the div tag because you used the span instead of a div. And we can give you line numbers, something that the browser doesn't, cannot provide to you as well. So as you can see, we're really focusing on the fact to make sure that we can give you errors as early as possible uh, so that you can um, get your application built and focus on the application code rather than uh, errors. Now, so far we talked about how to make the existing infrastructure faster. Now let's change gears a little bit and talk about how to do less work. So in Angular 1, um, the change detection uh, didn't have any specific direction and we had to run it multiple times until it stabilized. In Angular 2, we said, no, no, the data has to flow from the root to the children, and we give it a specific direction of flow. And when we give it a specific direction of flow, that means we only have to go through the loop once, as opposed to multiple times. Now, the second thing you can do once you have a specific direction is you can prune the tree, because effectively what this does is it creates a tree. And pruning the tree means that you can look at a, the tree and say, you know, a subset of it uh, doesn't have to be dirty checked for whatever reason. And so while the blue boxes represents the classical, you know, I just create my binding, everything magically works, and I've already shown you how it, it will be 10 times faster, you might still run into issues where you feel like your application is big enough that you would like to get more performance, and so you might want to uh, decide to prune the tree a little bit. Now there's different strategies which we allow you to do. You can, for example, detach a, tree, a subtree when you decide that it no longer needs to be changing in the future. You can um, say that the only time that the tree should be re-rendered is if its input has been changed. 
Or in the future, we'll be adding a, a ability to actually do explicit dirtiness on a particular component. So those are all different strategies we basically allow you to do, is to say, like, if you're willing to do a little bit more work, then you can help the framework by uh, shutting down specific branches of the tree and making it go faster. The other benefit you get is that because we have a specific way in which we process the change detection, uh, we now can give you proper hooks such as before and after child in it and before after child checked and so on, something which was not really possible in Angular 1. Now, the next thing to talk about is the memory pressure, right? So we've talked about how to go fast. We talk about how to skip stuff. The next thing to worry about is that we, there is a limited amount of memory in the browser, and especially on mobile devices. And so we want like to cut down on the amount of garbage we create as the change detection runs, because any garbage you create will actually have to result in a garbage collection cycle, which will put a pause into the execution of your application. Now, there's two ways to do it. Um, one is that we, we worry, well, you see these little boxes on the bottom that shows DI runtime, change detection, and view runtime. And those are all the things that essentially get uh, compiled out during the JIT process. The, basically, we can look at your dependency injection and we can say, ah, this component is always inside of a template of this other component. And therefore, if, there's, if, they, if you, the constructor is asking for the parent component, we can statically realize it will always get an instance of this other thing. And we can statically wire things up together for you. So in many cases, we can actually get rid of the dependency injection runtime that comes with it. Those are just kind of examples of what we can do. So the, the point is that we are really focusing on it holistically, not, not just at the performance, but also on other things such as memory pressure. Now let me show you one last thing that we do, which is that when you try to do everything you can do to make the application go faster, and you, s you still, for example, feel like we can go in faster, then the, the thing to take advantage of is that most uh, devices have multiple CPU cores. Uh, but browsers are single-threaded. So how do we take advantage of the additional CPU core? Well, we have this thing called the web worker, but it's kind of hard to work with it. So Angular is trying to make it easier. What we're basically allowing you to do is to say that you can execute the, uh, the a whole application in a web worker thread, and we'll take care of the serialization process to which sends the data to the renderer. What that means is that the web worker can take care of your application logic and maybe data processing, whereas the DOM renderer thread can take care of the rendering and animations, and hopefully make the application go faster in the process. Now the last thing is, we have this thing called bench press, uh, which we wanted to make available to you guys as well. And the point of the bench press is that we'd like, to, we'd like to measure the performance of the application framework. We have a lot of benchmarks where we have written it twice. Once we, we hand code the benchmark into what we think a best possible performance could be. And then the other one we do it inside of Angular and then we compare the two and see how we track it over time. Uh, we continuously monitor these things. So if somebody checks in something to our repo that for whatever reason uh, decreases the performance, then we can immediately go back and correct that particular thing. And we want to make sure that something like bench press becomes available for you. Now the thing about bench press is we keep track of both the execution time, the render time, and the GC pressure so that we can see what's going on with the application. And now I would like to invite to the stage the Lucy chart. And hopefully they can show you, tell you about how they use these particular performance characteristics to make their applications fast. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Mishko and Jules, for the invitation to share our story. Um, my name is Ryan Stringham. I'm a senior engineer at Lucidchart, and I lead our Angular 2 team. This is Ben Diltz. He's the co-founder and CTO. Um, Lucidchart was one of the first graphical applications on the web, built in handwritten JavaScript, half a million lines of it now. Over the last several years, our application has grown in scope and functionality, and it has gr grown organically into something many times larger and more complex than we initially envisioned. Um, earlier this year, we undertook an effort to um, modern modernize our application. We had an opportunity to evaluate many frameworks that have matured over that time. So we want to talk about why we chose Angular 2 and then some of the performance wins that we've had. So the first reason we chose Angular 2 is because of the template code that's easy to read and easy to write. Um, new developers can easily understand what's going on in the view. The one-way data binding is expressive. You can tell what's an expression and what's a string. Pipes allow us to easily transform data, for example, formatting the date here. 
Um, the second reason was because we could write really simple CSS um, since the styles are only applied to the components they're written for, thanks to the Shadow DOM emulation Angular 2 provides. So we don't need our, those deep, nested, complicated CSS selectors to style our application anymore. And the third reason was because we now have test testable view components, where previously with our handwritten JavaScript, testing our application was um, very difficult or impossible. Now we have a much higher code coverage in our Angular 2 components than the rest of our JavaScript. So now everything but the WebGL canvas is built using Angular 2. Um, so we had a couple of uh, big performance wins with Angular 2. We do have um, some portions of our application outside of the core editor that we've written with Angular 1, um, and change detection has become a bottleneck in some situations. As our new application was growing in size, we found that the change detection step was growing and it was starting to hurt our frame rate. Um, and, uh, but then we found that we could specify the change detection strategy to be on push. We had easily on hand already information about when our model was changing, when the view should be updated. And so by providing that uh, to all of our components, we were able to bring our change detector step down from over eight milliseconds on average to a tenth of a millisecond on average, which was a, a fantastic win for us. Got that slide. So um, another place where we began to be worried early in uh, the development of our Angular 2 app was startup time. Um, this is a profiler. Uh, capture of the startup of our application uh, as after it had grown to contain a large number of components. Uh, several seconds of solid CPU time were spent here in the startup phase uh, parsing and compiling the templates. Um, and that was really the majority and it was, it was really damaging our startup times. Um, but with the release of the new ahead of time compiler, uh, essentially that whole section of the startup completely disappeared. Um, and our, our startup times Im improved drastically. Uh, in fact, we were running an A-B test where we were, we were running the new editor versus the old editor simultaneously. Um, and we were tracking the load times uh, from the beginning of the first request to fading out the loading screen. Uh, and here you can see the comparison between our handwritten JavaScript editor versus the new Angular 2 editor. And we were losing with the Angular 2 editor at the beginning uh, due to those, uh, that CPU time we were spending uh, compiling and parsing those templates. Uh, but then uh, with the release of the new ahead of time compiler and some work that we did there, you can see that we came up and were neck and neck with our, our handwritten JavaScript editor, which was a, a huge win for us. And we were really happy about that. Uh, but then we found a way uh, with some additional effort to uh, allow us to use the closure compiler's advanced optimizations. So this is uh, the things we were hearing about um, global renaming of functions and properties and, uh, and so forth. And the reduction in code weight from implementing that uh, made it, which we released a couple of weeks later, uh, made it so that now the Angular 2 editor sees substantially improved load times over our own handwritten JavaScript. Uh, which was tremendous for us. Um, getting it working with the Clojure compiler was, uh, it was a lot of work. We, we learned a lot of things along the way, um, but uh, we also built along the way a sort of production hello world application to get an idea of how small an Angular 2 app could really be. And we were, we were able to produce a packaged hello world Angular 2 app, including the framework at a 27 kilobyte code size, which was pretty incredible. Um, and so uh, if you're interested in seeing how we did this, reading more about uh, how we got the closure compiler working uh, with the tree shaking and so forth, uh, we do have a blog post. Go to lucidchart.com ac2016. And uh, there is also a link there to a GitHub project that you can uh, clone and just run a build process. And you'll be able to see that yourself and play with it. So thank you. Hello there. My name is Stephen Fluent, and I'm a developer advocate on the Angular team. I love hearing about Lucid Charts and their story in terms of their performance achievements, but I always try and remind myself of why performance is important. And it really always comes back to user experience, where we're really building applications that are great for our users. And so building applications that are fast performance is very important. But another part of that is building applications that run everywhere. And one of the design goals of Angular is that applications that you build 
should be very easy to run on the web, on mobile, and on desktop. So let's, let's talk about each of those a little bit. So you already know about web, so I'm gonna skip that one. And let's jump into mobile. A lot of the applications we see and a lot of the customers that I talk to, they end up seeing almost 70% of their use cases actually coming from mobile devices. And that's really important for us to think about because when we're developing, it's very easy to forget that we have a very high power CPU, we have these desktop machines, laptops, but a mobile device has a much weaker CPU. Additionally, whenever you're building an application, anytime you're using the CPU, anytime you're running things unnecessarily, you're actually also consuming battery power, which also affects user experience. If a, a user ends up using your application and they find that using it depletes their battery significantly, they may not want to use your application in the future. I want to introduce you to one of my friends. This is the offline T-Rex. Uh, how many people have seen the offline T-Rex before? Yeah. So anytime you use Chrome and you access a website when you don't have an internet connection, you're gonna end up seeing him. And what he means is, hey, we can't give you the things you want right now. But fortunately, with Angular, we've considered this use case. And through the, the use of something called progressive web applications, which we've demoed previously, you're actually able to build applications that run in offline mode. And the reason this is such a, a great experience using Angular is because typically you're building single page applications. And the nice thing about single page applications is that you're actually able to ship those in, down in their entirety if you want to, to a local client, and then instead of going to the network for every request to, to look up all of your code and all of your data, you can actually access those things locally, which means that you can extend your user experience even into offline use cases. Another use case that we've considered extensively is the idea of desktop. I know everyone here has used some sort of desktop. We're not mobile only for the most part when we're doing development. Uh, and so understanding those use cases and taking advantage of those things can be very important. Uh, there's a project out there that I'm a big fan of called Electron. And what Electron allows you to do is to take advantage of the latest and greatest when it comes to mobile rend or excuse me, web rendering using the uh, web rendering engines and the virtual machines that exist for running JavaScript. But you also get access to an instance of Node that runs on the desktop, regardless of the operating system. And what that instance gives you is access to things like the file system and access to other platform capabilities that can actually be very difficult to access from just a pure web standpoint. And so being on all of those different places is very important. And so if we think about these as a spectrum, on one end, you've got things like progressive web applications, where you're still shipping a website over the wire to a user, but you're able to progressively enhance that in some use cases. Next to that, we've got things such as the Ionic project or Onsen UI that allow you to build applications that ship and live within the app stores so you get that nice app store presence, but still build your application out of web technologies. Additionally, we have things like NativeScript, which allow you to use Angular to build an application. But fortunately, due to our DOM independence and our ability to swap out renderers, you can actually render directly to native UI elements, getting an additional performance gain on top of what you would get by just having a, a web rendering engine living on the mobile device. Uh, and then lastly, we already mentioned the idea of using Electron to render applications on desktop. But it actually even goes beyond this when you think about running Angular everywhere. And that comes back to the server. Angular, due to its DOM independence, can actually be rendered and run on the, the server in either a Node environment or an ASP environment. Uh, and we're looking at extending that to other languages. And this actually gives us a lot of benefits. So while most search engines are capable of running JavaScript, uh, maybe there's a social integration that you're looking for. So when someone shares your web application out to the internet, uh, to Twitter, for example, you want to be able to render that application for that browser and for that actual use case. And there's also additional performance gains when you're shipping a completed experience out to, to users without even having to wait for the client to uh, run all of that code that you've sent down. So in, I want to invite up to the stage Nora, who's going to talk a little bit uh, from NPR about great, building great experiences using Angular. Nora? All right, thank you, Stephen. So NPR stands for National Public Radio. We're one of the main public radio providers for the United States. And we have offices nationwide, but our headquarters is this beautiful building right here in Washington, DC. So most of my department, which is NPR Digital Media, is working on a product called NPR One. And NPR One is trying to reimagine 
public radio in the digital age. So you can listen to short segments as well as long form podcasts. You can skip around, save stories for later, and share them with your friends on social media. So NPR One actually started out as a web app, but development pretty quickly shifted to native mobile because frankly, in NPR's experience, when it comes to audio playback, native is still superior. However, we've always kept the web app around, um, mainly for two reasons. One is that our research has shown that people really like this product at work. So they'll listen to the mobile app on their commute, but once they get to the office, they pull this up on their desktop computer, plug in their headphones, and listen while they're working. The other reason is, as I mentioned, you can share stories with your friends on social media. Well, they might not have the app installed if they're on mobile, but we want them to still be able to listen to that story that you shared. So they can actually do that, but then we very quickly upsell them on the native mobile apps. And so on, on the mobile, desk, mobile web app, um, this is much more of a pass-through experience. So what you see here is the original web app. Um, this was given to my team last fall to do a design refresh. And after talking to some of the people who had worked on the original, um, we decided it was built on top of such dated technology that, that the best thing to do would be to rebuild the entire thing from scratch. So after doing quite a bit of uh, technical evaluation um, of all the frameworks that are out there, we decided to do the rebuild using Angular 2. And this was for a few reasons. One is that usually when NPR does projects, we actually have a lot of legacy code that we need to include. Um, this is one of the few rare cases where that wasn't the case, and so that opened up a lot of options that we might not have considered before. Um, and along with that, this is very much a standalone, self-contained site. There's no crossover whatsoever with the rest of NPR.org, so that really lent itself well to an all-known framework like Angular that can both support all the needs of your app right now as well as what it needs in the future as it grows so you don't have that decision fatigue of trying to evaluate a million plugins, trying to figure out which ones best fit your app. Um, and finally, the team that was working on this was very small. There was only two developers, one product manager and one designer, and no embedded QA engineer. So the burden was on us to do a high level of testing. So we started with our first commit on January 31st when Angular 2 was in beta 2. And we launched exactly two months later on March 31st when Angular 2 was in beta 13. And this is what the rebuilt site looks like. You can see there's a complete design refresh. Um, and under the hood, um, it was a complete rewrite. Not a single line of code from the original was maintained. But perhaps one of the things we're most proud of is that we have 100% unit test coverage. It was very easy to get into the habit of anything that we wrote, also writing the test using Karma and Jasmine. And we have a full suite of end-to-end -end tests using Protractor, which is perhaps the biggest win, because in the past, um, if NPR wanted to do something like that for one of our projects, we would have to collaborate with a QA automation engineer who would write those tests for us. But in this case, the two developers on our team were actually able to write the tests because they're just Jasmine and JavaScript. Um, one fun fact is while all of this was going on, a different team was working on what you see in the right reel over here, which is what we call the persistent player on NPR.org, um, an audio player that stays with you as you browse from story to story. Again, different team, different project, and they had decided to use React for that. Um, so as you might guess, there were a lot of questions about is it really appropriate for one team to be using React and another team to be using Angular 2? Shouldn't we just pick one? But our team had a hypothesis which is that React and Angular 2 share many of the same core ideas, and there is a place in every team stack for both. Um, and we believe that we've proven our hypothesis correct. Um, we made a couple of explicit decisions to sort of help that along. We decided to use ES6 instead of TypeScript. Um, and we also added Redux-like state management functionality using the plugin NGRX store. All of this allowed us to sort of uh, decide on some common design patterns for our apps, and that allowed the React developers to be able to participate fully in all of our code reviews so they can help maintain this code in the future. So for us, it's about collaboration, not a competition between frameworks. So if there's any question in your mind about whether Angular 2 is ready for your production app, I invite you to check out one.npr.org and decide for yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nara, and a big thank you for, on behalf of the team for thick, uh, sticking with us through our beta period. Uh, so one of the things that Nara mentioned was the use of NGRX store. And in terms of when we think about developers writing applications, one of the most important, one of the di most difficult challenges that developers face is managing data. And so we've spent a ton of time thinking about that, but also we spent a ton of time working with other partners and other people in the community to make sure that it's really easy to use and manage data 
at large scale in real world applications. And so I wanna talk you through a few of the various opportunities and options that we have right now. Uh, the first that I'm gonna talk about is Apollo, which we're also gonna hear in a minute uh, a little bit more about. And Apollo is a client and a server environment that really fits in well with Angular 2 in terms of its ability to use decorators to declaratively say, this is the type of data I need, this is what it looks like. And you can even do that across components. And what Apollo is gonna do is it's going to look across those components and it's gonna provide a services layer that combines those queries. So even if you have nested queries or you're looking for a subset of data, it's only gonna have a single round trip to a server that's gonna resolve data, whether it's coming from a RESTful endpoint, from a SQL or MySQL database, really any sort of endpoint that you can write a resolver for using GraphQL, which, which is very cool. Another fantastic data integration that we have is with Firebase. So Firebase has a lot of great features, but one of the features that they're best known for is their real-time database. And we have a fantastic library called Angular Fire 2, which allows you to integrate directly with those things. And for me, there was a magical moment when I was building applications with Angular Fire, because I would simply point to an endpoint that lived in Firebase, and then that data would automatically live within my application as an observable. And then I could set up my view and my template however I wanted to, and I could use an async pipe. And then what would end up happening was any time that data changed, either via my own user or via another one, that change would automatically propagate back to the view, and then any changes that I made locally propagated back to the server as well, which, which is really a fantastic thing. Uh, and then the last two that we've got here are ngrx store and ngredux. And these are both libraries that take reactive principles, those same similar principles to the idea of having observables that automatically react to what you're doing within uh, your application within your data layer, and then present that in nice, easy to develop ways for application developers. To give an example of, of ngrx store and ngredux, you simply set up your dispatches, and so you say, these are the events that I wanna be able to happen, and then it uses a unidirectional data flow to process that, that information and make sure that you can access it, and then you get the same sort of observables out. Um, and actually, Apollo uses that under the hood as well. So I, I wanna invite up Uri to talk a little bit more about Apollo in particular. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen and Jules, uh, for having me, and thank you, the Angular team, for an amazing, amazing framework and uh, release. Thank you. Um, so now that Angular 2 is out, um, which is a very big deal, I started to think, like Stephen said before, why did we actually started building Angular apps and what we did, we did we search for? And for me, it comes down to two things. One is user experience, like Stephen says, and developer productivity. And now with the new release, I thought, well, let's see what we, where are we standing there? And like we saw all on the previous like, slides, um, in terms of rendering performance and bundle sizes, I don't think we can get any better. And how good are we? Well, if you look at my talk uh, last year in the keynote, I demoed, um, I did a benchmark between uh, the, the leading view layers. And if you remember from last year, you can, if you see the red line from Angular performance, you, don't, you barely see that because Angular already a year ago was faster than all of its competitors. And when I, after I showed that slide, uh, Igor came to me after and told me, well, wait, we have more st stuff on our sleeves. And all, all the stuff that you saw this keynote just happened on this year. So I, it looks like uh, with Angular today, in terms of performance and rendering performance, uh, we have no limits. We can use Angular on any platform and our users will be happy. So. What's left, right? Like, uh, in terms of user performance, uh, user experience, what, what is holding us back from writing all of our apps in Angular 2? So uh, my hypothesis is that there's one more thing that we need to solve, the next bottleneck, once Angular cleared out all the way for the other bottlenecks, and this is the network layer. Um, and this is what we, uh, the, the Apollo team, uh, uh, set out to solve with our da data uh, framework uh, uh, that we created. And we used GraphQL, which I talked a little bit about, that gave us a lot of power to solve that problem. So, okay, we have our Angular 2 app, everything is good. But now we, send, we need to send a, an HTTP call to the server. And usually, we don't know when, when we're gonna get, we don't know when we're gonna get the response, we don't know how long it's gonna get, take. But 
you know, we're Angular developers, right? We, we, don't, respond, we're, we don't care. <laughs> we send a response, and when the server developers will send out the response back, we'll be fine. I mean, we, we submit the, let's say we submit the comment, and we wait, and if we're really nice, we might add a spinner to it. But if we think how uh, our users are using an, a, a modern apps, and we think about, let's say, how our users add a reminder or archive, uh, archive an email with Gmail app or press a like on the Facebook uh, page, it looks more like the, the, the example on the right here. When they submit something, it happens instantly. They don't know there's a network. And it's not like Google or Facebook has different networks and different internet that we do. They just, use, uh, they just have data layers that, that handle that. And it's not the job of the server developers, it's the job of the client developers. But it's hard, so we need a framework to solve that. Uh, and it doesn't matter how cool our spinners will be, <laughs> the experience on the right will always, always be better. I'll, I'll show you another example. So you can see here uh, just a random, uh, random app that we just, we're going back and forth between two uh, different pages. And it's fine, like the experience is okay because we need to get to this data from the server. But if you look on the right, um, that everything has happened instantly. And both of those examples, the clicks are synced. This is exactly the same time. So how do we do that? First of all, we prefetch uh, the data beforehand when we hover some stuff, like for the comments we prefetch before. And when we go back, we already have the data, so we don't need to fetch it back from the network. So those are just a few examples of um, things we can do to improve our experience. Um, another thing, like if we're talking about developer experience and the things that Angular gives us, when we go in and now starting to write our, our APIs or our HTTP calls, we have a lot of problems. Usually when we go to a REST endpoint, there's no API documentation. Usually we need to call multiple requests to get like, let's say a, he a person and then all of his friends and all his information on his friends. It's multiple calls. It takes a long time. And if we're building mobile apps, it's a mess. So in Apollo, we try to solve those problems um, because uh, we, we, want to, we created a, a, a framework that a library uh, that, that every, make your app feels instant. You, it's actually um, mitigate all the latency from the network for you with using all kinds of methods like optimistic UI, for example. It's, a small, it's small, it's open source. It sits only on the client inside your Angular app and you can integrate it uh, gradually into your app. You don't need to migrate all your endpoints into that. It's also completely pluggable. Like you can change everything we do because we're basing, uh, we're basing it on Redux and we're exposing everything that's happening through RxJS. And we had that and we built that, um, and for the better developer experience, we built it on top of GraphQL. Uh, and it's, we're not, not the only ones who chose that, that protocol. This is, like, looks like the future protocol that more and more the uh, indus industry companies are using. And when we talk about developer experience, I'll, I'll mention just a few things why you should care about GraphQL and why we chose that. So first of all, with GraphQL, as the client developer, you have the power to decide what information you need from the server. So you specify that information and you get exactly that information from the server, not more, not less. And it's all in single one trip. Doesn't matter how many resources do you query or how nested your query is and how many joins you use to do on, on your Angular apps. Uh, and it's also a typed API. Like we're now talking a lot about TypeScript, but when we go to our API, uh, because, so we can like validate things during development, but we don't do it when we call our servers. With GraphQL, we can validate our queries before we actually uh, run the app and before we call the server, because we know exactly what will come, and that brings us a lot of great experience when we write. We can write. Um, uh, API queries exactly like we write code. We get validation, auto completion, and documentation out of the box. And by the way, it's also support real time for if some of you needs those types of use cases. So what it all adds up to is that we used to write apps that we, I can call them maybe uh, a page-based development. We used to write our whole page 
and we used to write, render the whole page, and we used to call a single API, a render API, a, a data API, to get the information for the page. But what happened is that we moved into component-based development, where we write our components, encapsulated components, and we write data dependencies specifically for those components, and then with GraphQL, it's an API that let us and write our, our apps in a component-based development. We write our, our queries inside our components, and, they're, they're, and, and then, Angular, uh, and then uh, Apollo and GraphQL will take care of merging those requests and getting this data into us. So, um, and Angular, 2 always, uh, Angular and Angular 2 already supports the, this component-based development out of the box. So we just need an API to support that as well. Um, so if you want to learn more about it, you can check out my talk tomorrow or the architecture panel later today, or just Google Angular GraphQL or Angular GraphQL Apollo. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. So thanks to all the speakers who joined us for the keynote. And before we leave you today to enjoy the rest of Angular Connect, uh, there's a few thank yous I need to make uh, for the people who make Angular a better platform. Uh, so first, thank you to our Google developer experts, uh, a lot of whom are here today. These are the rock stars in our Angular community that you can count on to always be up to date and provide you with some help. If you want to find the people who have achieved this award, you can find them at developers.google.com. Uh, my slide did not build right there. Thank you to our professional services groups like Grape City and Accenture who provide end-to-end -end consulting for large enterprises. We were blown away to hear from Nick at Wrangell uh, this week that their business is already over 50% Angular 2. That kind of enterprise adoption makes us super excited. Thank you to all the educational providers who are creating learning curriculums for absolutely every level of Angular development. And thank you to our technology partners like Onsen UI and Meteor, Ionic, NativeScript. Um, you can find all of these uh, partners at angular.io slash resources, and they're just doing wonderful things to make developing with Angular even better. And thank you to our community leaders. These are the people who know how to bring people together for great experiences and are organizing meetups and other events all around the world. You continue to inspire our team with your focus on diversity and the fun you all seem to have. And of course, lastly, and maybe most important, to the thousands of contributors that contributed to the Angular 2 code base, thank you. This is <laughs> this is absolutely not the end of the journey for Angular 2. In fact, in so many ways, this is just the beginning. Now is the time when we focus on making all of you successful and excited to build with Angular 2. We're looking forward and eager to meet the next million Angular developers, to see what they contribute back and what you contribute back to our community, and the very cool apps we expect you all to build. Have a great conference. <laughs>